Satan said, this time you've done it. Now you've gone too far. How could the Lord receive you? You're ruined now and scarred. But something deep inside of me said, Child, you're still my own. And, and my love for you is still the same. So, child, just come back home. He gave me more than I ever asked for, more than I ever dreamed. He gave me more than I could imagine. When I came back home to him When I asked him to forgive me He gave me a robe and a ring I said make me as one of your servants But he made me a child of the king I thought about the years I'd wasted as I walked the homeward way. And I rehearsed time and time all the words that I would say. But when I finally climbed that last long hill, my father I did see running with his arms open wide in love to welcome me. He gave me more than I ever asked for, more than I ever dreamed. He gave me more than I could imagine when I came back home to him. When I asked him to forgive me, he gave me a rose. I said, make me as one of your servants, but he made me a child of the king. When I asked him to forgive me, he gave me a robe and a ring. I said, make me as one of your servants, but he made me a child of the king. Of the king.
Laura Atkinson, who we mentioned last week. Uh, we want to remember Lee Hensley, Margaret Hassel, Tammy Dunn, um, my brother in law David um, has improved slightly. He went to a nursing home this week. Uh, that's not always a good thing. <laughs> so, We just uh, want to remember him and my sister. I know that going to a nursing home is probably going to be is a little less taxing on her. Um, so we want to remember them in prayer. And again, all of our travelers who are um, going here and there. Uh, and Terry had also given me a request for a friend of hers a son had a motorcycle uh, accident this week. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his name is Jacob, and he uh, had hip injury, and he's already had two surgeries to relieve pressure, and we want to remember him as well this week. So, uh, a little too much echo on this to. You can't hear me? Oh, I just have to speak a little louder then. I don't usually have that problem. All right, before we pray, let's sing a song first. And we're going to sing a song that is an older song. It's been around a while. Um, but we just don't tend to sing it very much anymore. So. This is called the Spirit Song, and you'll probably recognize it after we start singing it. Am I talking loud enough now? Yes. Okay. Good. Because when I sing, it'll be too loud. <laughs>
Truly, Lord, you have blessed us beyond what we can bear sometimes. But, Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Father. We need your touch just now, Lord. As we enter into this worship, your worship, may the presence of the Holy Spirit be upon us, Lord. Each one. Come and fall on us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to be here. To be able to talk to you, Lord. To praise you for all that you do. For Lord, we are not worthy of anything that you give us. But we thank you, Father. We thank you. Just now I pray, Father, that you would be with this friend of, of Terry's, this Jacob, as he's lying in the hospital right now, suffering from a head wound, head injuries, Lord. We always know how difficult, how difficult that can be. Oh, we pray that you would touch him just now. Lord, if he does know you, I pray for him that you would speak to him. Show him your way. Help him. Father, I pray too that you would be with Lee Henson. Be with Laura Atkinson, Terry Young. Pray, Father, too, that you would be with Tammy Young. Be with my brother, Lord. Be with my sister, Lord, Susie, and I pray that you would touch them, help them through this cancer. Lord, there are so many cancer victims out there, and we know of many of them. We offer them all to you. Lord, when it comes to cancer, many times you're the only healer. The doctors can't do anything many times. But Lord, you are able to work in the Father, I pray just now that you would be in this place. Be with each one that's traveling in the next few weeks. I pray, Lord, that you would touch them. Thank you, Lord, for bringing people back to us. I thank you, Father, for all that you do. Lord, as we learn more about you, as we hear from your Spirit, both in the music and in the preaching work, Father, I pray that you would be with us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. You may be seated.
Spirit, touch your church.
Father at this time. Thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to praise your name, to hear from you, to be with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to know you better. Bless us all from you. Bless John as he sings. Bless Dr. Ken as he shares with us the word that you have placed upon us this morning. I pray, Father, that you would touch us. Bless us, O oh Lord. Help us to care for others like Jesus cared for us. And let your spirit fall on us, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's me again. <laughs> I always got to have a little bit of ditty here before I sing the song. He, he goes right along with the title here. I looked up some of the, what the saying about uh, when you walk with Jesus. Uh, the concordance has a, in the dictionary says walk, walked, and walking. To roam, traverse, and advance by steps, to pursue and a course of action. I looked it up also in the, in underneath the heading of, in the dictionary of how many verses were had walk in. And it goes there's twenty verses here. And has either walk, walks, or walking. Walked in the fire, walking in the garden, walk humbly with the Lord. And there's just so many wonderful things to uh, uh, sayings in there. Also, sometimes I think about what my mother said one time when I was angry at somebody or not be too well or something like that. She said, you always walk a, walk a mile in your shoes and you'll have a different outlook on where he, where he comes from and where he's going. Also, sometimes I think about the time when you say, you, you say, well, I take three steps forward and I fall back two. You're going to get nowhere fast. <laughs> and it just, uh, we have to walk with Jesus to get anywhere. I'd like to have you I'd like to stand and sing with me. I would appreciate it.
start off? Should be on. Hang on. Did I break it? No. <laughs> wow. Where two things kind of simultaneously happened at the same time. One was is that we've been really fighting to get our our permit, you know, for the uh, at our school, Logos Christian Academy, for our modular building, and we've been fighting to get the county to cooperate and give us a permit so that we can put it in place and, and begin to use it for classes. And um, that has been about a three or four month fight battle, basically. And uh, the day that the, the day that we got it, the next day after we did finally, the county said, "Okay, we're going to start the process. We'll be able to get the permit." The next day, uh, someone from Oasis Church came to us and gave us a wonderful gift for the for the the, the, the modular building. So I want to say thank you to all of you. I don't know who contributed to that, but it was a sizable gift from us, and it's really going to help get that that building put in place. And provide a place for a high school. Amen? Amen. Yes, so thank you. I'll, I'm going to give you an applause. Thank you very, very much for that. So, well, uh, this morning we're going to start a, uh, a bit of a series that's probably going to take, take about the next three to four weeks to, uh, to accomplish. And um, if you guys, if, for those of you who were here before, uh, possibly remember that the last one, my last message was on thriving. Do you remember that? You say with me, thriving? Thriving. thriving. Well, well, let's say that, but let's thrive as we do it. Thriving. thriving. Yeah, very good. I love that. Uh, <laughs> I spoke with you at the very beginning of that message about the, the divine uh, design from the very beginning in the creation of this world and the creation of us, for that matter, as well. That in that design was that creation and humanity and the souls of humanity would thrive. That was his purpose. Imagine um, what that new creation. You know, we, we only get a glimpse of creation that 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 we experience under the curse. Am I right? So all the thriving you see going on happens in the context of individuals that are fighting uh, weeds and, and thistles and thorns and all those things that I got stuck with yesterday as I was working in my backyard, <laughs> and you do as well. So, but can you imagine what that was like? For Adam and Eve, I've always imagined that that it was just an explosion of life. That life was exploding everywhere, all around, and not only just the physical aspect of life, but as well the soul aspect. For God created an environment first, the planets and solar system, and all the rest about it. But initially, a garden, as we discussed earlier, He established this garden through which uh, was the idyllic scenario where things could grow, could explode to life. And I can just imagine, you know, Adam and Eve having this wonderful place in which you know, oh, I think I'll have an apple plop, there's an apple. Or I want a banana and there's a banana, right? Not a bad place to live. I'd love my backyard to be like that. <laughs> I, I have on the west side of my interior wall uh, four grapevines that are growing and they're just about ready to harvest. Uh, the purple grapes are turning purple and the Thompson seeds are turning you know, green, so they're always green, but they're there, and they're they're ready to harvest. Of course, I've always had a vision of sitting under those grapes, and Karen with a palm branch, waving me as she feeds grapes to me. <laughs> that hasn't quite come to pass yet, and please, ladies, don't talk to me afterwards about an issue that I might have. <laughs> but the point of the matter is, is that at the beginning of creation, life was just, was just bursting forth. And, um, and of course, all of this uh, came to an end uh, and was spoiled because of the fall of mankind. Uh, and as a result of that, man would have to then work a cursed soil by the sweat of his brow. And 
and fight weeds and thorns and thistles and that sort of thing, just simply to survive. And in kind of contrast, to, or actually in similarity, because God's presence no longer dwelt with man, man's soul also had to strive just to survive. Okay. But as we all know, the gospel changed everything. Amen? Amen. The gospel changed, or at least in regards to the souls of men. We're still fighting weeds and dusts and thorns, and we still, we're still, you know, fighting to survive. Not like the rest of the world. In fact, I would suggest to you that in the world that we live in, the United States of America, would you say we are thriving physically? Yes, we have far more than we need in comparison to the rest of the world. But it is our souls, in fact, that do not thrive without the presence of God. And so for many, their souls are simply trying to survive every day, day in and out. Now, before we get into what we're going to study this morning, I do want to take a moment and just talk about the thriving in regards to the physical things, or better, maybe said, the financial things. Okay? Um, there is nowhere that I can find in the New Testament where there is the promise that we are going to thrive financially, no matter what they say on TV. I can't find it. I don't see it anywhere. In fact, I find the very opposite. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Paul says, For we have brought nothing into this world, this world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. And if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. Amen? Does this sound familiar? It, it ought to, because the richest man in his time, a man by the name of Job, lost everything in a single day. And at the end of it all, he was okay with it. He understood that God gave those things to him. And he understood that God had the liberty and freedom to take them away anytime he wanted to. And he, those were not his dependency for thriving. In fact, what he ended up doing in the context of those circumstances was worship. And that's because though he was not thriving economically, he had lost everything. He was thriving spiritually. And so his response to his circumstances was worship. And so he worshiped God. Paul wrote then uh, in, in the book of Romans, he said, The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. It is not about houses, it's not about cars, it's not about finances, it's not about your Roth IRA, it's not about how much money you have in the bank, it's not about that at all. It is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And uh, for those who take their, um, I don't even want to say the word liberty, take heresy basically, take and convert what scripture you know, does not teach and encourage uh, individuals to make the kingdom of God about prosperity, um, I have no good words. <laughs> so, all right. So in the kingdom of God, thriving is about our souls. It's not our bodies, not our finances, not our savings account. And I hope as we go through this series that will, it will not only be about our souls, but you'll see that it's also about the souls of others. So that's, that's what it's about in the kingdom of God. Now, in the last message that I gave here, I referenced this Samaritan woman that Jesus met at a well. And I want to go back to that, uh, that event once more and kind of pull out a few more things of significance. So if you go to John chapter 4, that's where we're going to be. So go there and uh, take a peek at this. I'll go ahead and just kind of read through the portion that I want to focus on this morning. John chapter 4, starting with verse 5. And he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. They came, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away from the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus said, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And she said to him, 
Sir, you have nothing to draw with the well, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. Then Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Nice portion of scripture. All right, so I want to focus on that, and uh, I want to again look at verses 13 and 14, because this is a woman, obviously a Samaritan woman, who um, who first comes to a well to what's actually the thing that she does every day. She comes to this well from the village which she's a part of. She has a pot with her, the scripture records. She goes to that well to fill the pot. Jesus is there. He's thirsty, of course, as we've read. He's there, tired, weary, and, and wants, wants a drink of water. He asks her for a drink of water, as you've noted, and, uh, and she's baffled. First, that he would even speak to her because she's a Samaritan. And I think secondly, because he probably wouldn't have spoke to her just because she was a woman in that culture. And, uh, and so she's a little baffled by this whole thing. Uh, he responds, uh, well, he asks her for a drink of water. He, she's baffled by that. He then responds, if you knew the gift of God and the one who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would ask of me and I would give you living water. And then here's verses 13 and 14. Jesus says, Everyone that drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. Now the woman, the, the water that the woman sought every day was a physical water. It was so that she could physically survive. The water that Jesus is offering her was a spiritual water so that she could spiritually thrive. Let's say it again, ready? The water the woman sought each day that she sought for her physical survival. Okay? The water that Jesus offers to her is so that she could spiritually thrive. So the water, the well, all of that is just this incredible metaphor that Jesus is employing trying to get to what is the need, the true need that she has, which is a spiritual water. In verses 15 through 18, Jesus then asks her about her husband, if you guys recall that, and, uh, and she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus uh, says, well, yeah, you're right, you don't have a husband. You actually have five husbands, and the guy that you're living with right now is not your husband. And what he does in that is identify the well of her soul. She is looking toward men to be the source of love for her life, the source of life for her soul. And, and what has happened over and over again is, as you can imagine this, she's got the first seven, husband, she's gone there with her pot every day, and she's dipped out of that well, and because it's a well that she only takes from, the well runs dry. So she gets rid of the well. She goes and gets another well, and then she dips out of that until it runs dry. And then she gets another well, and another well, and another well. Okay. All of those wells run dry. Okay. And now she's with an individual she doesn't even marry anymore. Because she knows, she realizes that there's only so much life that can come from a human being. And Jesus is offering her something far better than that. She's, uh, he's offering her eternal uh, 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 life. A life that, uh, that has no, no end to it, okay? okay? The key point in this is Jesus' is, of course, the metaphor of the well. If we think about it, we have to conclude of all people who should understand this metaphor, it's going to be the woman. She's the one who comes every single day to this well. She's the one who draws from it and goes back. And then the next day she comes back again, and the next day she comes back. She should grasp the metaphor. And she goes to the well every single day. The well becomes the very source for her physical thirst. A well that was dug by Jacob several centuries before and has been utilized by people for centuries all the way until this day. It's still giving water every day to those who come to get it. Okay? So Jesus uses this well as a metaphor for this woman 
so that if she drinks the water that he gives to her, that in fact she will no longer be a person who needs a well. I don't want you guys to hear this. This is really important. She won't be a person who needs a well. She will be a person who is a well. Big difference. Huge difference. This will become a well of water dwelling up inside of you like an artesian well that will gush forth out of you that will have no end to it. So you no longer need a well. You now have become a well. And as a result of that, oh, by the way, that is what thriving looks like, amen? amen? That's when you've got more life in you than you can contain. That's when you're no longer a thirsty individual. You're a gushing individual. You're not in need of something. You're actually pouring forth something that you already possess in abundance. That's a thriving life. That's what it looks like. Well, the reality is, is that Jesus is inviting her to a very different life, an opposite life that she is living. I don't want you to miss this. Her previous life, or the life she's presently living, is a life every day coming to a well in order to be able to drop. In her particular case, that well is not Jacob's well. It is physically. But that well now, her present well is her husband, or her, the man that she's living with. That's her present life. He's inviting her to a totally different life. Okay, a life that needed water at one point to be able to survive, now becomes a life of more water than she needs. Hallelujah. Amen. That's, that's the life that God offers. As a result, she no longer needs a well for her thirst, but she actually becomes a well, not only for herself, but for others as well. That's God's plan. That's God's design for your life. That's the gift that he wants to give to us. The, the, that gift of the Holy Spirit with our lives and everything that we sang about this morning. So, in, in, in order to embrace this, in order to realize this for her life, she needs to do something significant, and that is she needs to leave the survival mode I'm here every day to get what I need for me, and I'm going to be back tomorrow and do it again. And get into a thrive revival mode. You like that? That's a brand new word, guys. <laughs> Leave the survival mode and get into the thrive mode. I learned to do that, by the way, by my oldest daughter, who came in one day when she was five years old and said, Dad, I am dying of thirst station. <laughs> I go, what? She goes, I'm dying of thirst station. I need something to drink. And I said, there's no such word. And she looked at me and smiled and said, there is now. <laughs> okay. So you've got to leave the survival mode. You've got to do a thrive mode. And you might say, there's no such word. And I will say to you, there is now. That's the mode she has to get into. That's a totally different life. And it's a life that she has to abandon. The survival life and step into the survival life. <laughs> okay. Is it a choice? Oh, indeed it is. Indeed it is. Okay. And this, this well, of course, that, that provides this kind of thriving life. And if you remember the words of Jesus with me, if you would have known, if you would have known the gift of God, which is, by the way, the person of the Holy Spirit, and the one who asks, you would have asked of me, and I would have given you living water. Okay. The, the journey between survival, the survival mode of the survival life, and the thriving life, the survival mode, the journey is asking. All this woman has to do is asked for. It's really that simple. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. And she's willing to make the journey from the village of which she lives in every day in order to get the physical water to be able to physically survive. The only journey Jesus is asking her to take is to ask. Just ask. Yeah. And that's one of my words for you this morning. Just ask. If you're in a survival mode this morning, 
All you have to do is ask to get to the survival need. If your life is defined by just getting through and surviving, you don't have anything left for anyone else. You barely have enough for yourself. All you have to do is ask and get to the place where you have more than enough for yourself and for others. It comes by asking. Luke chapter 11, would you go there please? We're going to spend a little bit of time on this this morning and, and we're probably going to spend a little more time on it in the weeks to come just to give you a heads up on it. This was another one of the references that I used the last time that I spoke here and I want to uh, kind of unpack it a bit more this morning. Verse 5 and uh, in chapter 11 of Luke. And he said to them, Suppose one of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me for a journey and from inside, he, uh, and I have nothing, I'm sorry, to set before him. And from inside he shall answer and say, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children are in, and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks, it shall be opened. Verse 11, Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son, for a fish, will he not give him a, will he give him a snake instead of a fish? Um, I'm sorry. Now suppose one of your fathers asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All right, I want to kind of unpack this thing verse by verse, if you'll allow me to do that. So we're going to start with verse 5. And he said to him, Suppose one of you shall have a friend, and shall go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. All right, the word here, there's actually two words in the Greek for friend. Uh, the first one is eteros, and eteros refers to a companion or a comrade or a partner or a fellow sojourner, someone that you're traveling with, you would consider an individual a casual type of friend. Okay? However, Jesus uses the word phylon, and phylon has at its root the word phileo. And I'm not sure if you know what phileo is, but it's the Greek word for love. Specifically, it's the Greek word for brotherly love or for familial love. It is the word in which is the root for the, for the name of the city, Philadelphia which Philadelphia, when translated in the Greek, means the city of brotherly love. Is it still the city of brotherly love? <laughs> and then the, uh, not by what I hear, it doesn't sound like it is, but that's theoretically what it's supposed to be, is the city of brotherly love. Okay, so phileo was used here. Uh, and so as a result of that, when we look at, we read this, and Jesus employs this word, friend, he's, uh, he's applying it to, or he's inferring, that there is a familial, friendship, brotherly kind of love at play here. Okay? And all that to say that love is a big part of what we're talking about. Right? It's a big part of it. So Jesus begins the parable by appealing to a kind of a tender, brotherly, familial kind of a love. So this friend that has come in the middle of the night, he's like a brother. And in fact, by the way, because Israel is made of 12 tribes, he may very well have been a brother. Or he may at least, in the very least, have been a part of the family. Right? Because all of these people are related. So it's unique about Israel. It's all one big, huge, gigantic family. Made up of 12, 12 brothers who made up 12 tribes who made up the nation of Israel. Okay? That's kind of the, the, the way they perceive themselves. It's all family type of thing. So Jesus begins with this kind of tender, familial kind of love. And I just want to say before we get into the, in the book of all that we're going to discuss this morning, and of course for the next two or three weeks, that all that we're going to talk about in regards to thriving, even whether it has to do with this particular parable or it has to do with one with the well, 
All of it has to do with one thing. It has to do with love. Right. It has to do with love. Love is the foundation for it all. Love is the basis of it all. Love for others is the very core of thriving. The reason Jesus offers to the woman at the well a living water is because of love. That's why he does it. The reason Jesus was given by the Father to us is because of love. For God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Love is always at the core of it. Okay? Love for others is, is the reason or the ways and means through which we can actually thrive. Okay. So uh, the reason this is, a, this is not an issue for the original man, again, he said to him, suppose one of you have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. Why is this guy going to this guy at midnight? There's a presumption here. The presumption is, is that this guy loves him. That's the presumption. Harry, is it okay if I come up, come to your house at one in the morning and you know ask for a burger for a friend of mine? I, I, I got a thumbs up on that. I'll give you my pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There is an absolute presumption of love here that I, I can't do this with anybody, right? You can't do that with just anybody. You only do it to an individual that you know actually loves you. Okay. So we have here um, really an interesting combination of, of uh, friendship, <laughs> different kinds of friendship. We have a friendship that is trusting in love. That's the guy who's going at midnight to knock on somebody's door. He's trusting that that guy loves him enough to let him interrupt his life in most inconvenient moment, right? Midnight. I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. My wife's in bed. The door is shut. It's a very inconvenient time. So we have this individual who's going to this person, trusting that love will overshadow the inconvenience. Okay. Number two, we have another friend who also, who has love. Okay, so when the first man, the very first friend, knocks on his friend's door, which is probably, I would guess, well after dinner. That's why he's hungry. He opens the door to receive him and to take care of him. Why? Because of philanthropy. Because of love. That's why he does it. Because this man loves him. He's concerned for this individual. So he opens up the door and says, yeah, come on in. The problem is, is that he invites him to come on in, and the guy comes on in, and he goes, man, I'm starving. And the guy says, well, I love you, man, but I don't, I don't have anything for you. My cupboards are bare. But I know somebody that does. So just hang out here for a minute, and I'm going to go to this guy's house. That's the third friend. That's the third guy in the story. So he goes to him, but the problem with the third friend is, the third, the, the third friend does not have any filet. He doesn't have any love. So when he goes and knocks on his door, the friend basically says, go away. Okay, go away. I, I, I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. My wife's in bed. The doors are locked. Everything's taken care of. Go away. In other words, I don't have that kind of love that would inconvenience myself on behalf of you. Follow me? So love is missing. We got a friend who's trust. We got a friend who's trusting in love. That love will make a way for him. We got a friend that does have love, and then thirdly, we have a friend that has no love at all, except for himself, right? Because it's really not about his children being in bed or his wife being in bed or the doors being closed. It's really all about him being in bed with his little full tummy, wanting to wanting to go back to sleep, right? So it's a love more for self than it is for this friend of his. It is, in fact, the tender love of another that is central to experiencing any kind of a thriving life. It's fundamental to that. This guy who wants to stay in bed is not going to experience the possibility of 
on a Friday night because of a lack of love for that individual. Verse 6, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. This is a man that had enough for himself but not enough for anyone else. Surviving, obviously, is only when you have enough for you. Thriving, of course, is when you have enough for, you, for others and yourself. This man was surviving in stark contrast to a man who tried to turn the individuals away that was, in a practical way, thriving. He had the food. He had everything that was needed because he ends up giving it to him because of persistence in the end. But he doesn't have love. He doesn't make a place for this individual. Now, the interesting thing is the, the individual that does not have anything, I don't have anything to feed him, she, Jesus doesn't judge him for that. There is no judgment, there is no condemnation, and I don't think he does us as well. I don't think he condemns us when, he, when someone comes to us and we don't have anything for them. I think he would condemn us if we, someone came to us and we turned him away because of lack of love. Right? I think that would be the thing that he could judge us by. But he does not judge this man at all because he doesn't have anything. He's fine with a man coming late at night after meals have already been eaten. He's fine with the fact that he's coming at a poor time. In fact, I would suggest to you that Jesus loves to send people to us in inopportune moments, in inopportune times. In those moments where we don't even have barely enough for us. He loves to send people to us at that time. Okay? But I guess one of my questions for you this morning is, are you okay if Jesus sends someone to you, to you and your life, totally unexpected, at the worst time you could ever imagine, when you are maybe just surviving, and they're lacking what they need, and because of that, You'll have to go to God to get it. Are you okay with that? The only way that you'll get over that hump is, is with love. It is because you love that individual more than you love you. And it is because of that love that you will get from God what God has for you to give to them. And in that moment, you start to live the thriving life. Because you're now having something more than you need so that you can give it to someone else. You guys tracking with me so far? I know it's a little heavy, but hang in there with me. Verse 7, and from inside he shall answer and say, Do not bother me, the door has already been shut and my children are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. This is the friend without tender love, without the phileo, without that for his friend. He does have, in fact, tender love for himself. There will always be reasons. Guys, you got to hear this. There will always be reasons why you should not let people with needs into your life. There will always be reasons for that. And you've got a litany of them. Okay? You've got a litany of them. Even Jesus, hanging on the cross, let someone into his life. A fellow cross member. A fellow individual suspended from a cross. Even in his last moments, he let this individual in, into his life and into his kingdom for that matter. So the bottom line is if love is mandatory <clears throat> in order for us to fully realize the thriving life. So verse 8, 9, and 10, I just want to read them briefly. I tell you, even though you will not get up and give him anything, because he's a friend, Yet because his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it shall be opened to him. Jesus provides to us the ways and means for thriving. Asking, seeking, knocking. Note, it is not for yourself. It is for others. This is a man knocking on a friend's door on behalf of an individual who has a need in their life. And he can't meet that need. And so he goes to the source where he can. 
as a result of that, he asks and he asks and he knocks and he knocks. He seeks and he seeks and eventually he receives what's needed. Why does he do that? Because of his deep love for his friend. That's why he does it. Now Jesus goes on to say, it is not that way in the kingdom of God. Now suppose one of your fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He'll not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So ask. You don't have to beat the door down. Just ask. Seek. Knock. And Jesus won't give it. He's now raised it to a familial level of father and son. Son asks for something to eat. Is he going to give him something that will kill him? No, he'll give him exactly what he needs at that moment. Okay. All right, we're almost done. You hanging in there? Very right, good. Okay. Now we get to the very heart of the parable, of, and it's not just about a physical need; it's mostly about the need of the soul. Remember, the water is about the soul, so is this, because the, the thing that we receive is the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about a real egg, a real, uh, a, 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 a real fish. We're talking about that which is needed for the human soul. Okay. So in John chapter 4, Jesus employed a physical well, a metaphor to illustrate the spiritual artesian well that can live and dwell and spring forth from us. And in Luke 11, he employs a friend and a son metaphor to be able to illustrate this kind of spiritual provision that is available to us by the person of the Holy Spirit. The okay. Father wants to give us, all of us, the Holy Spirit for the needs of the soul of others. I'm going to say it again. The Father wants to give us the Holy Spirit for the needs of the souls of others. And He will send us people he will send this church individuals who are thirsty. He will send people to this congregation that are hungry. And, and he will send them here because this is a church that will seek and ask and knock for what it is that God wants to give to these people through you. That's his plan. So, Key questions this morning. Are you ready? This is a test. It's only a test. For the next, I don't know, 30 seconds. Here we go. Number one, are you in a survival mode as an individual or as a church? How many say no? Okay. Okay, we got one. Are you in a survival mode as an individual at church? You come here every Sunday morning because you need to get something for yourself. Or you come here every Sunday morning because you have something to give for your soul. You come here every, every here Sunday because you, so you can thrive, or so you can survive. Or you come here every Sunday because you're thriving. Okay. Are you in a survival mode as an individual church? If so, God has so much more for you. He has so much more for you. you know, I, I thought six years ago that I was going to retire. And, and, and and I thought, okay, I might do some things and things like that, and those were good things. I wanted to write and, and do some you know, things that I didn't have time to do when I was pastoring and all that sort of thing. And it didn't take me very long to find out that that was not God's plan for my life. That in fact, what he wanted to do was put me into a position to where every single day of my life, someone knocks on my door at the most inopportune moment with a need of which, more often than not, I do not have what's needed for them. It's become my daily life. And I love it. I thrive in that. Because in that moment, even sometimes as the parent or the student or the teacher, or whoever may be is sitting in my office, with whatever the need might be, in that moment, in the quietness of my own soul, I'm going, Lord God, I don't have what they need. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. So I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, 
what have you got for me in this moment for that person? And you know what he does? He gives it to you. He gives it to me. And in that moment, I have something more in my life that I didn't have before that person stepped in to my office and sat down. And that something more is what I get to give to that person. I get to experience a thriving life. Amen? That's how it works. Okay. Number two. Would you like to get out of the surviving boat? Okay. I, I think Jesus wants to make the same offer to you that he made to the woman at the well. I think he wants to make the same possibility, the same kind of circumstance that he that he talked about in the parable of the man who had a friend come at an inopportune moment. And you had absolutely nothing to be able to give to him. You want to get out of the survival mode, that's how you do it. You open up your life to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, pour in you and through you for others. You open up your life for people to come into your life with needs, soul, spiritual needs. And when you do, God will then provide by you through, through your asking provide for those needs and it will be his provision through your life to them and I'm telling you your life will change when that happens I pose to you which who gets more out of when someone if you lead somebody to Jesus who gets more out of it the person who comes to Christ or the person who leads that person to Christ it's really hard to tell because it's thrilling to lead somebody to Jesus amen and it's thrilling to come to Jesus. This is life in the kingdom of God. Number three, are you okay with Jesus bringing someone into your life? Even if it is an opportune time, and you don't have anything to give to them because you barely have enough for yourself. Are you okay with that? In order to be able to thrive, you've got to be okay with that. You've got to put yourself in that position. Okay? And the reason you do that is because of a love for people and love for others. Number four, will you let Jesus give you a tender heart for others? That's what it all comes down to. Will you be able to receive from God what, what he has to give to you for other individuals? And receive people that he wants to send your way. And then, of course, the last one is, are you willing to do whatever is needed? Are you willing to ask, seek, and knock, ask, seek, and knock, ask, seek, and knock? Can you add to your life this element of of seeking, asking, and knocking at the Holy Spirit to give you something you do not presently possess. Not for you, but for someone else. Okay. The answer to this, these questions is yeah, the possibility of entering into a life that is well beyond survival, but is into revival. <laughs> Thriving. Okay, uh, we're ready to close. You guys ready for me to close? Yeah, it's like 10 after. We've got a long time. Uh, stand with me, would you? Stand, stand, stand. In Luke chapter 5, verse 11, which is what we just read, that was the very first verse of chapter 11. It says, He said to them, Suppose one of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, Lend me three loaves. Three loaves. Why three loaves? Why not, oh, some meat, maybe some vegetables, that'd be nice. Uh, key lime pie would be good. Pineapple upside down cake would be better. That's a hint, by the way. <laughs> Why three loaves? I mean, the only thing you're going to feed this guy is bread. Three loaves of bread, that's what you're going to give him to eat for the rest of the night. I mean, that's did not that cut, cut my head. Go, why three loaves? Well, the Apostle Paul actually shows us what those three loaves are. And we're going to consider those for the next three weeks. Each one of those loaves. Those things the Holy Spirit gives to us for the souls of other people. And we'll consider them one at a time. Are you ready for that? Good. All right. Bow your heads with me, if you would. Father, we live in a nation that is, is practically and physically and financially 
many ways of thriving. And yet we also live in a, in a nation that is barely surviving in their soul. Barely surviving. And in the, in the midst of all of that, you have placed your church. And in the midst of Casa Grande, you've put us, you've placed us. You put us in a place where we can become a well of living water. You put us into a place where we can, on behalf of other individuals with great needs for their soul, come to you for whatever your Holy Spirit would give to us to be able to give to them and meet their need. And so this morning, Lord, we stand in your presence and give you permission to fill us, to flood us with your living water and let us be a resource for others and to bring to our lives, even in inopportune moments, even in times when it would be inconvenient for us, or difficult or challenging for us, we give you permission, Lord Jesus, to send folk to our lives so that you can touch the needs of their soul through our lives. And we pray for that this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? Can I give you a blessing before I go? Is that all right? Here we go. I wrote it down. Is that good? Is that what it is? May the Lord richly bless your heart with a fresh tenderness for others that will give occasion for God to send people to you and will lead you to pursue the Holy Spirit for what He has for you. And in doing so, may you thrive as individuals and as a church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Normally we sing, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Today we're going to switch to, come Holy Spirit, I need you.